Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much to you all for coming uh, to this book talk this evening, uh, Creative Writing um, with the UK fantasy author Natasha Pope. Um, my name is Tim and I'm from the British Council in Hong Kong and we've collaborated together with um, Hong Kong Trade Development Council and our hosts for tonight, um, Hong Kong University Library, to bring you this event and uh, we're really delighted to see you all here, so thank you. And um, before we kick off, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, Natasha, um, you all have got a pencil and a bit of paper on the way in, so Natasha will explain more about what that means later on. And also, some of you will have uh, questionnaires on the seats beside you on, on your own seats. And if you are able to just fill those in um, at the end of the event and leave them with the staff on your own, I would be very grateful for that. Thank you. Um, so, to give Natasha a proper introduction, um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Jessica Valdez from the um, Department of English here at HKV just to say a few words. Thank you. So, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Natasha Gulley today um, before she gives her book talk. Um, I'd like to say a few things so that you can get some background on, on her work. Um, her debut novel, the Watchmaker of Willowbury Street was published in 2015 and won the 2016 Betty Trask Award. The novel is set in 1880s London, on edge after a series of Canadian bombings. The main character, Nathaniel Steepleton, works as a telegrapher at the home office. When a watch mysteriously saves his life from an explosion, he gets caught up in the bombing investigations and meets an enigmatic Japanese watchmaker. Kena Mori. Events eventually take characters and the reader to Japan. Um, and um, I, I also want to note that the novel is not just a historical novel about British Victorian London, it also interweaves this story with Japan and the events ongoing um, in Japan at the same time. Her second book, The Bedlam Stacks, takes its characters to a fantastical Peru. Um, and she currently has a debut, her sequel to her debut novel coming out in, I think in March 2020, uh, called The Lost Future of Cover Harrow for the Watchmaker, Billigree Street Number 2. So we have that to look forward to. Um, and I want to say that I particularly appreciate about her novels that they mingle uh, history of uh, Victorian British London and Victorian Great Britain with it sort of moves across the globe. So it's not only located in London, like we see with a lot of Masterpiece Theatre works and other works uh, that look at Victorian London, but also take us to Peru, take us to Japan, take us to other parts of the globe in a way that's a sort of more realistic rendering of that period in the 19th century. Um, it also, her work also challenges uh, sort of uh, British colonialism and questions uh, a more imperialist outlook on the 19th century. Um, and I, I work on the Victorian period as well, and so I particularly appreciate that about her work. Um, and I should note too that she is a fantasy writer, but she's also a writer of historical fiction. She brings fantasy and history together, um, and she meticulously researches her novels, so they're based in actual uh, facts, and in nonfiction, in, in research that she's done on, on Peru, on Japan, on Victoria and London, but she mingles that with fiction, with fantasy. So there's a wonderful working between of fiction and nonfiction in her work. Um, so a little bit of background too on where she is now. She's currently an associate lecturer at Bath Spa University in Bath in the UK. Um, and she studied English literature at Oxford University and also earned a creative writing in ink. Um, so I'll hand it over. We all want to hear from the writer today, um, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much for that absolutely lovely introduction. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Is this OK? You can hear me? Good. Hi, guys. We good? Nice. Okay, that's much easier anyway. Okay, so thank you for coming tonight. Um, welcome to the university if you're not at the university already. I'm so glad you could come. 
Now, don't worry about the pencils and paper for now, okay? I will traumatise you with those later. For now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I want you to get out of today and what I want you to take away with us today. So, I chose this image for the first slide of the show for a really good reason. Now, the most pervasive and the most horrible myth about people who write, about writers, about anyone creative, is that they're just born being able to do that. It's tempting to feel like writers are this kind of weird, different species who have some sort of special connection to a world of creativity. And everyone else can kind of look in and they can make a wish, but the writers, they go down on the rocket chain and they go down and they stick their toes in the creative waters and oh, isn't it marvellous and wonderful? That's rubbish. There is nothing extraordinary about writers, any of you can be writers, this could not be perfectly true. There is a reason that writing is surrounded by kind of building words like workshop and wordsmith and playwright. Playwright, W-R-G-H-T, as in shipwright. Writing is carpentry, just for language. Did anyone here have to study rhetoric at university? A few, like some miserable hands went up just then, like not fond memories for you. So, rhetoric um, was particularly taught in the Roman Empire and it was the art of speaking in public. And it's really, really interesting to look at old rhetoric manuals because they use something brilliant that we've done in modern language textbooks. The Latin ones are absolutely brilliant. They miss weird. Frightening sounding words like polysynthetic or exusis or chiasmus. And they sound ridiculous, but actually, what they are is just really specific stylistic techniques for when you're writing in this case of speech. Polysynthetic is really simple, it's literally just when you repeat the connecting word like and or but or dog. So when you say there was a lion and a tiger and a bear and a horse and a unicorn, and you tend to do it when you want to emphasise that. Out of space, or you want to give some sense of your service. Like kids do it all the time, don't they? And then there's all this, and then there's all this, and then there's all this. Well, it's interesting. And the the other one that I mentioned, it's just where you mention a normal word again and again, and again, and again, and again. See what I mean? So this is really simple things. But by naming them, what we do is that we make them solid. We turn them from this vague nebulous thing that we all know into something that resembles a toolkit. They are the tools with which we write, whether we know the names for them or not. It's just useful to know that those tools are there. Now, writing is treated very differently to every other craft. Carpentry, pottery, pattern cutting, even to fine art, because you cannot see it all at once. You can't take in the method in one second. You have to spend weeks at it. It's obvious what carpenter does. The wooden chisels are right in front of you, and you can watch a carpenter make a chair. But you can't watch a writer write a novel. Or you could do it take ages. You could set up a Facebook live stream, couldn't you? And you could say, now, here is J.K. Rowling adjusting three words on page 100 to fit an image onto page 4, which smooths the whole shape of the novel out by some tiny degree. But you can't see at a glance what that image does to you. Or well, definitely not in the same way you can watch a carpenter turn a new pattern onto the table like this. To see the shape of the book, you need to spend about a week reading it, don't you? And in order to see how, how that shape changes under construction, you would have to read it again and again and again as the writer is writing. That's a really difficult thing to show someone clearly. And it's therefore horribly easy to shroud that actually very straightforward process in mystery. But for me, at least, making a book is exactly the same as making anything else, whether it's a table or a pot or a dress. Writers are surrounded by tools and techniques that are hmm, shelves and shelves of them. And novels have shapes. Fashion designers make their first job in character, don't they? Rough fabric and then we discard it. 
Nu cum am înțeles că ei s-a făcut în felul, nu mai stră mai în felul ăla, să se urmăresc cu ziua de aici. And the styles of the words, sketching techniques, that would be just as many as you would find in a fashion studio, and apprentices have to learn more. Now that idea really comes as a shock to a lot of writers, or a lot of people who want to write and are starting out. It really shocked me as well. Until I was signed by a publishing house, I had no idea how much writing has to happen before you end up with a novel. I now think that for every 10,000 words I write, I throw away 9,000. That's about the ratio that I think I work to. And that's, I think, relatively uh, efficient for a writer. Some of my friends who are writers just they can churn out loads and loads and loads and loads. And, and I read it and I'm like, this is terrible. And you go, I know, it's the first one. So this is normal. You just build parts of it and put them together. But this construction process is not obvious, as I said. For what you throw away and the amount of work you keep is, is clear if you're a tenor, if you're a carpenter, if you're a potter, or a printer. But a lot of writers don't have any idea what this process actually involves until they're doing it, because they have never seen it from start to end. What we all see is the end product. You see novels, right? But you don't see them anything. That is insane for me to think about it. How would we think about painting if nobody had ever watched a painter pick up a paintbrush, mix the colours, sketch on canvas, and build up the images? How difficult would it be if every single painter had to work that out from scratch just by being told about it instead of showing it? If none of us had ever seen that process, if we had only ever seen perfect finished paintings hanging in galleries, then the situation of artists would be just about what it's for writers. This is a thing that you go extraordinarily blind in a way that you do not in any other art or any other art. Now, the fact that the process is invisible is annoying to itself, but it can cause problems further down the line as well. It means you don't know when you're finished to start. A lot of self-published ebooks. Do you do you have a lot of self-published ebooks in Hong Kong? Do you kind of see this very often? Like books that are not produced by a proper publishing house, but just kind of you know you upload them to which they kind of almost unedited. Yeah, so you, you do hear about this. People always upload ebooks themselves, they always self-publish. They always self-publish, sorry. About four drafts before they should, almost always. You would not be allowed to submit writing that say in the traditional publishing house. Some first time writers experience something that I can only describe as shell shock when they're first exposed to the full force of a professional editor. Some of them will sit down with a manuscript and tear it to pieces with a red pen. That's their job. There are stories, of course, and I think we've all heard them where half the manuscript gets cut, and you have to rewrite everything. And these are often handed down as kind of horror stories of cautionary tales in the industry. And that does happen. Of course it does. It's happened to me. My editor took out a whole third of my last novel, and I had to rewrite another third um, in response. But you should not be horrified by that. That's just the job. That's how this works. That's the same as laying down beams until they fit together and make a scene. And for me, it's actually the part that I love, like these big sweeping structural changes when the story is kind of very movable and entirely still in flux. So, but the novel is not what you have on the page right now. It's the shape of the thing in your head. And the writing process, that kind of very inefficient, process of chucking away 9,000 out of 10,000 words. This is just making the page match what you have in your head. So that's a very long way of saying that I just want to make sure, before we really get started, that there is no mystique to this whole process. There is no special well of creativity. Writing is a culture. It really honestly is. Learning that craft takes a long time. Anyone can learn it. Anyone in this room, anyone ever. 
Although, what we will certainly do, and certainly what I did, is start out writing various shades of rubbish. And that's fine. An awful lot of people who could have been stupendous writers if they stuck at it are put off by the idea that you must be an elite genius. And that either you get it right and perfect the first time, or you should stop. Do not be so ridiculous. Of course, that's not true. Okay, a word about pen to paper, okay? You've got some paper and pens. Does anyone have a bit of paper and pencil? If anyone doesn't, just do you have supplies floating around? Okay, if anyone doesn't, there are some supplies at the back if you would like some. Okay, I think we're okay. Don't worry, you can come around later. Um, I know that this is rather an intimidating thing to be handed after you've had a busy day already. Um, but what I want to do today is try and show you how this invisible process works. And the only way that I can show you is to make you do it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to guide you through one way of getting started with your story. And by the end of this session today, if you'd like to participate in writing along with me and do the exercises, which are all very short ones, um, you will come away with a scene and a core idea and the structure of a new story. And you can go away and work on it if you don't need to. Now, just to be clear, I am not going to make anyone stand up and read their work. That is traumatic and it's awful, and I really don't condone anyone who makes people do that. If you write anything today, that is just yours, okay? No one should ever show anybody anything that they've written uh, until they're ready to be. And this isn't being silly and it's not being childish. Writing is incredibly personal. Um, and the analogy that I always make is if you wouldn't trust somebody not to snigger at you when you're just in your underwear, do not show them your writing. And actually, I think getting together the mental defences to show a piece of writing to a whole group of people um, in writing workshops requires really the same amount of effort as talking yourself around to being a, a life drawing model. It, this is not for everyone, so I'm not going to make you do it, don't worry. But please do. Write along and don't get scared. Just give it a go. Okay? I, will, I promise I will guide you through this. At no point will you be confused about what's going on. And if you are, please like, raise your hand and yell at me because that's what you're allowed to do here. Now, people who do not write love to talk about inspiration, don't they? It's one of those awful buzzwords that goes around all the time and you're not People who do like us are usually more honest. So what we're going to talk about now is stealing, because that's what inspiration really is. One of the hardest things, I think, is to work out what you actually want to write about. How many of you have kind of sat down and gone, I would love to write another one day, but I just I can't get the first few sentences on the page, or it always fizzles out after the page. Can you do this? Feel a bit anxious about the whole thing. No, everyone's a genius. Okay, good. You don't need this thing. But I would say, even if you do feel like, like that, you already know what you're going to write about, even if you think that you don't. And that's what we're going to bring out today. Now, we all read. We all watch TV and we all watch movies. We all have a perfectly good grasp of what a story is and how it works. All of that narrative experience will inform everything that you write, obviously it will. Now, I think the human mind is a lot like a food processor. Lots of ingredients go in and soup comes out. The difference between horrible soup and really good soup is knowing the proportions that you need to put in and how to use the right spices and all that. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to put the right stuff in. So let me explain how I do it and how it works. However, amazing and original I think I'm being, I always end up starting stories in the same way. It's depressingly repetitive. It always starts when I've read a book or watched a film that I love and something about it really sticks with me. You know it's stuck if you're still staring at this idea two or three weeks later. For me, a really good example is the Daphne de Maurier novel called Rebecca. How many of you are familiar with Daphne de Maurier and Rebecca? A few people. Okay. For those of you who have never heard of Daphne de Maurier, go away, get her books from the library, she's amazing. 
Rebecca is my favourite novel of hers. Now, it's a really weird book because it's about a narrator who doesn't have a name. Well, she does, but she never tells you. It's all narrated in first person, so she just says I all the way through. And all that we know is that her name is spelled a strange way, so she might be called Lee or something like that. But really, what it's about is a very young girl who is miserable, and she is the page travelling companion, because this is set in the 1920s, of an odious American woman who she despises. Now, this girl is really young. She's, I want to say, like 19, 20. I'm really going to be Jessica. You don't care. <laughs> she, look, she teaches Victorian literature, and I'm like 30 years out of take. <laughs> it's like, no, I know nothing after 1901. Um, this girl is about 19 or 20. She's miserable. And one day, when she's in a hotel on holiday with this horrible American lady, she meets a wonderful, sexy, charming man called Maxim de Winter. And there's something a bit weird about Max, and we know that there is right from the start, because they go on about two dates, and then he says, you know what, you should marry me. He's 42, and he's talking to a girl half his age. And she, because she's useless, goes, yeah, brilliant, off they go. Now, they go home from the hotel where they've been called to this glorious British country estate called Mandalay. And when the girl arrives, she realises that Maxim's previous wife only passed away quite recently. All the servants are still very loyal to this woman. And the first Mrs. De Winter, Max's first wife, is called Rebecca. And she comes to be this presence that hangs over everything she was in. She is everywhere. She was so glamorous and so beautiful and so sexy and everyone loved her. And by complete contrast, our very young narrator is little and plain and frumpy, or so she thinks. And she just feels she cannot ever fill Rebecca's gorgeous, dolce and shoes. And very gradually, we start to realise that there's something wrong about the way that Rebecca died. Apparently, she died in a boating accident. Did she really go? Did she? She did and this is the mystery of the book, you have to work out what happens. Now, one of the genius things about this book is that the narrator is a feeble idiot. She doesn't ever ask the right questions. She never confronts her very controlling and weird husband about anything. And if she did, the book would be about 20 pages long. So it's, it's just as well that she's, that she's useless. Now, that's, that's the book that stuck with me. Once you have that book in mind. The next step in the process is to pinpoint exactly what it is about that story that you find fascinating. And often it boils down to something very, very small. For me, it is this. This is a moment about halfway through the book. And it's once the young woman has arrived at the house as Max's new wife, and she's been introduced to this horrible woman who turns out to be the housekeeper. She is called Mrs. Danvers and she is evil. A little bit after this, Mrs. Danvers actually tries to make her commit suicide. This is how evil Mrs. Danvers is. Now, Mrs. Danvers is an absolute creep. She has kept every single possession of the first Mrs. Winter, of Rebecca, in perfect place in her room. It's like a shrine to her. And it's really creepy. And she takes the new wife in and she goes, touch her coats. Aren't they soft? Aren't they beautiful? It's real fun. And you're going, oh, get away! And then she does something quite creepy. She takes the new young wife, or the 19, feels like she's quite ugly. She takes her up to the dressing table and she puts her in front of the beautiful Rebecca's mirror. And she shows her her hairbrushes. These are beautiful silver hairbrushes. And this is what Mrs. Stanley said. She's talking about the early days when Maxim de Winter and Rebecca were first married. And Rebecca had beautiful long hair. And Mrs. Danvers says in her, I, I, imagine that I'm a really creepy 90-year-old lady and we'll get about what Mrs. Danvers is like. She says, Mr. de Winter used to brush her hair for her then. I've come into this room time and time again to see him in his shirt sleeves with two brushes in his hand. Harder, Max, harder, Rebecca would say, laughing at him, and he would do as she told him. 
Don't be dressing for dinner, you see, and the house filled with guests. Here, I should be late, he would say, roaring crutches to me, and laughing back at her. So far, so innocuous, right? Really innocuous. This nice man is brushing his wife's hair. It sounds like they're having quite a good time. You'd be wrong not to imagine that. This, so this is what half of you could do. But this is what Max de Winter has to say about Rebecca right at the end. He says our marriage was a farce from the very first. She was vicious, damnable, rotten through and through. We never loved each other, never had one moment of happiness together. Rebecca was incapable of love, of tenderness, of decency. She was not even normal. He's calling her a psychopath. And he says, he, his next bit is about a page later, and he's, he's talking about just after they're married. He says, I found her out at once, five days after we were married. Do you remember that time I drove you in the car to the hills of Monte Carlo? I wanted to stand there again to remember. She sat there, laughing, her black hair growing in the wind. She told me about herself, told me things I shall never repeat to a living soul. I knew then what I had done, what I had married. Beauty, brains, breeding. Oh my God. So he knew five days after marrying her that he had married a psychotic nutcase. And he's true to his word here. He never really tells us exactly what it is that Rebecca had done, the things I shall never repeat to a living soul. What he does tell us is that she pretty much holds him hostage in his own house. And she goes away and she has affairs with lots of other men often kind of on purpose to bring shame on his neck. Now, we know that she's very dodgy early on in the book because Mrs. Sanders talks about, she talks in very loving terms of how Rebecca was very cruel to animals. She would drive her spurs into our voices. She's a nasty piece of work. And Maxim is realised. But let's go back to that first quote that I love about the hairbrushes. So this is when they first married, but it's definitely more than five days after they first married. Max says that he realised that she was a psychopath after five days and they didn't have a single day of happiness and here he is brushing her hair. Why? Does he want to brush her hair? I really do not think so. And I find that really fascinating. Um, Rebecca, as a novel, is usually read and usually taught as one of those books that explores how a very female, uh, sorry, feeble female character can enable a very toxic form of masculinity. And as I said, the narrator is even useless. But what I find fascinating about this section and the moment where we hear about how Max uh, brushed Rebecca's hair is that um, after reading this story, I read other lessons in one of the books, and she's not preaching. She's very blunt, she's very funny, very clear views, and I don't think she, well, she is writing about an abusive relationship, but Max isn't the abuser. If you did a gender swap and you looked at what Rebecca does to Max, we would yell domestic abuse straight away, right? and there wouldn't be any question that he was right to do all what he does. I will not tell you because that's his problem. I want you to go away and read this book and you'll love it. And the reason I think that, um, sorry, well, oh, I'm lost my place. So this is a moment of domestic affection, apparently. He's brushing her hair. Amazing. But I don't think he ever wanted to brush her hair. Of course he didn't. I think this is a weird, slightly sinister form of control. And just like everything else she does to him in the book, um, it's kind of very, it's very vague. Demario never comes out and says, this is what's happening, Rebecca is the bad guy. But that's kind of delicious and mysterious and brilliant. And I think that moment with the hairbrush is one of my favourites out of anything I've read for the last few years. <laughs> now, it's your turn to do some thinking. What I would like you to do is have a really good thing, just for a couple of minutes, about one or two or even three moments from any story you've read or watched recently that say we're not talking about like huge sweeping plot points and kind of difficult things to write down. We're thinking really small things like Rebecca's hairbrush. 
on a piece of paper, just note down a few bullet points of these moments where just something stuck with you from the story. I don't mind if it's a film, a TV series, a novel, it's all storytelling, it's all fun. But just have a go. If you struggle, try and use your feelings as an objective measure. When did you last feel something when you read a book or watched a film? When was the last time you went, wow, that was brilliant? That's what you're looking for. And I think you only need, hmm, I would give you three minutes to decide on a few of those moments. Just for the moments, just really quick, okay? I'm timing you, don't think I want to be, off you go. This is the moment for people to run to the limbs, but they don't run. By the way, I'd like to refer to these moments as your shiny stuff. Think of yourself as a magpie, you're collecting the shiny things for later. Just the bright things that really give them notice and stick to you, anything like that. You are a dragon with a horn of gold, you are a magpie with a nest full of things. You have one minute left, I told you I was timing you. And stop. Well done for those of you who gave it a go. Don't worry if you didn't get the loads. One will do. It's all fun. So I'm going to just take you through the next stage of this. What next? What happens once you've isolated this moment in a novel that really kind of makes you feel sorry? Next is to ask yourself how you would have written it. It doesn't matter that you've not got a plot structure or even a vague idea of characters or anything. None of that is relevant. What you do is you take the one thing that you found interesting from that novel and you write it in that way. I told you we were going to talk about it. There are two ways that you can do this. The first way is slightly easier. If you're not too confident yet, what you do is you do this as fan fiction. So you take the exact situation, the exact names of the characters, completely wholesale, but you rewrite the scene the way that you would like to see it done. The second option is the advanced option, and this is to take the core idea, but just cut away the specifics of the original stories of the characters, and you start building in bits and pieces of your own. Now that sounds really vague, so what I thought I would do is show you what I got from that scene that I was interested in attacking to work in. Now please be forgiven about this, because I only wrote this a few months ago, and I've not shown it anyone else yet. I haven't even shown my agent, my editor doesn't know this that it exists, it's just you guys at the moment, okay? So be nice. This is what I got. In the whole room, Ariette had a dressing table with a triptych of mirrors which reflected everything in threes. She was rubbing shea cream into her hands when I came in that night. Everything smelled sick and sweet. Scent brought out strong because she had candles littered all over the table. They were stuck in old wax to the cover of a Bible in Latin, propped by a snuffer in the shape of a bell. Like always, she handed me a silver hairbrush over her shoulder. It was a shining room with a screwdriver's design in the back, full of knotty vines and twitching leaves. I kept my eyes down and away from the mirror, aware that she was watching me. Her hair curled in places because she just bent down from things. I drew the brush down through it, sheened chestnut in its lovely spaces and rich black in its others. She was turning a fishing hook over and over between her fingertips, and nails shining nearly as much as it was itself. It had hummingbird down, so made the spine bright and delicate. Ow! she said when the brush pulled at its angle. She stabbed the fishing hook. I snatched my hand back, I had to jig the hook to get it out. Bright blood brushed down my face and tapped into the back of the top of it, which I hadn't realised I was still holding. I pressed my hand to her. Too slow, she said to me. I smudged a dot of blood with the tip of her nose and she laughed. I kept brushing her hair because it was supposed to be a hundred strokes and I'd only done one before. So that's my version of what Mrs. Danvers tells the young girl in. This was the very first thing I wrote on a blank word document. It isn't the beginning, the middle, or the end of anything. I wrote in first person literally because I couldn't be bothered to think of a name for this character yet. 
in my head he was just Max and Winter. In the end, I decided that he was called Sasha Mandeville because Max and Winter's house is called Mandalay. I want to break it down a little bit so you can see competitive bits and they're not really simple. When you were a kid, or if you are a kid now, or if you have kids now, did you ever play with the associations game? Like where someone starts with the word like apple and then you might say uh, something linked to that word. You might say forest and back and forth like that. So someone goes apple, forest, um, squirrel, pig, farm. Do you ever play that when you were little? Yeah, a few months. Okay. You all know how to play, I think. And that's basically what writers spend their time doing. We like to give the impression that we're clever, but we're not, we're just interact with the game. When you have that thing that you want to write about, that moment that I made you write down before, it's always a good idea to sort through your brain and decide what else this thing reminds you of, this situation reminds you of. You play that game with yourself. So, what I found really interesting about that Rebecca passage was that this might be domestic abuse. And when I think of that, I think of evil. Yeah, Tim. You're <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>, excused. <laughs> so it really is evil. It's insidious. And these, these words that I'm using are really interesting. Because they're words that you grow up speaking English, you really associate with religion. Which is interesting in itself. Now, I don't think this, this lady who I was writing about is a devil. I don't believe that anyone is evil, but sometimes you do get this kind of whiff of sulfur or something, don't you? Like you do something very strange and you're very evil. So, okay, how do you suggest evil without just kind of reversing it out and idiot? Answer, you use a few images that are associated with it, but you don't ever say hell or devil. And the solution I got, and bear in mind this is the first draft, so it is rubbish. The solution I got was to say things like triptych, this word at the top. And I think I really associate that with hell because have you, have you ever heard of an artist called Hieronymus Bosch, which is the best name of anyone ever called? Hieronymus Bosch? He did these amazing hell vision paintings, and he did them in triptych. So he just did three. It's called the Garden of Earthly Delights, and there is nothing delightful about this painting. It is horrific. It's full of people kind of burning in hellfire, it's absolutely awful and, and terrible. So I associate triptych with hell. But what I also associate is Bibles, bells, and candles. Because my book, Bell and Candle, is a particular phrase, and I don't know, I don't know how in use it is in Hong Kong, but it means to excommunicate someone, like bell and Excommunication from the church is massive. So those are pedantic little images, but I wanted to put them in because for me that really suggests devilry and hell imagery and all the nasty stuff that I want readers to think of when they read about hell yet. So great, we've got an idea for a scene and a sort of core image to start writing. But for me, the next hurdle was that I wanted this to be a bit weird and a bit tense, but I didn't want to just hand over everything all in one go and have minor writer come out and say, oh no, I'm so miserable, but we learned to love the lich. That's really important. For a start, these men, a lot of men don't even realise that it's possible for women to subject them to this kind of behaviour. So he doesn't really realise he's in this situation, but he doesn't know. So what he wants is a way to show him noticing this without noticing it. And I think this is where writing in first person is really useful. Because characters can feel things and gain impressions without really having to recognise that feeling. And then it happens, Stephanie Moria is the absolute queen at that. She has this amazing moment where when the young woman drives in to Mandalay at first with Max and Winter, they have to drive all through a lot of woodland because the house, Max's house, is way in the countryside in a very beautiful district of England. It's always kind of it, the climate is very warm. And they pass out of Woodland onto this huge drive that is flanked on either side by massive rhododendron trees. And rhododendrons have these amazing, beautiful, pinkish red flower 
so the whole avenue up to the house is becoming kind of flaring red. And you would think that's nice, right? This is a beautiful image. Oh, no, no, no. Instead of saying this is kind of this is really beautiful, the narrator instantly hates it. She doesn't say that they are beautiful. She calls them a slaughterous fruit. So immediately, when we should have had this beautiful imagery, we suddenly placed with the language of an abattoir, of a slaughterhouse. And really, what's going on is that she has a bad feeling about this house and about Max, but she doesn't really know why. Yet. All she knows is that she hates these bloody fruits, isn't she? So, what do you see what you do? Normally, getting ready for bed is nice. Shea cream is nice, silver hair watch is nice, so maybe it's not nice. Sasha hates the smell of the cream, he hates the design of the wax of the hair watches. I don't do it as well as Natalie Gamari, but it's the same idea. Finally, the most effective way for something horrible to happen to your character is if they think it's normal. Again, contrast. So, as I say, this is not a story, this is just a snippet. The scene gives you though is the core of an idea. And you can't write a story unless you know what you're writing about. Writing an early scene like this in response to something that has stuck with you is the fastest way to find out what it is that you really want to write about. You are now going to do it. So, first things first, have a look at the list of uh, interesting, significant things that you've written for yourself and choose your favourite one. If you only wrote one, great. You now, do you remember we were talking about playing that association game with yourself? Apple, dream, forest, squirrel, fish, plant. What I'd like you to do now is make a new list. What does the idea that you've chosen remind you of? What are its associations? What are its connotations? I went from a domestically abusive relationship to hell imagery to that weird painting I told you about to excommunication religion. But just write down whatever comes to your mind and think around it as much as you can. Does that make sense? Yeah? Have a go for two minutes. Just write down everything you associate with the situation of the idea that you've been there. Okay, we stop. Hopefully, you've managed to think of a few associations that you have with that favourite idea that you chose for your list. So hopefully what you've got now is your original interesting idea from the book you learned and some images to go with it. Those images provide you with a way in, with a way of thinking about and explaining the concept that you're writing. What I'd like you to do now is start writing your first paragraph. Think how you would write this scene that you're interested in, how it would be different from the way it's done in the book or the film you and try and use one of the images that you've come up with um, in your association game to inform the way that you write about it. So mine was I started using kind of religious imagery and hell imagery. And it was just a way it was a way to start thinking about what kind of woman is our list. So if you feel less sure, what I'd like to do is write it as fan fiction. Use the original characters, use the original place, everything, but just change what actually happens. For those of you feeling more confident, just pull away a bit from the original. And if you're really spicy, keep going. If you get stuck, start on some dialogue. Dialogue will always push you forward a little bit. Does everyone sort of understand what's going on? Yeah? Are there any questions at this point? Dead silence, excellent. You have <laughs> you have four minutes. Don't worry if you don't end up with a really long paragraph, but just try and write something. Some response to that interesting thing that you were fascinated by to begin with. Thread it through with some image that you associate with it, the language that you associate with it. And you'll come out with something that looks a lot like that first paragraph. You will. Go. Four minutes. It doesn't matter what you write, you can, you can write, you can introduce an important character, or maybe you just want to do a little bank of description about a place. Whatever you prefer. One minute. 
Who might be able to see it in the room? And stop. Well done. For any of you who want to write more but struggle a little bit, that's actually a really good technique to use. Just turn everything off for five minutes, for only five minutes, and write on a piece of paper. And I think it's quite surprising how much you get done when you force yourself to do it for four minutes, for five minutes. And that's just how you get started. So, you've done really well, by the way. I'm really pleased with all of you. What next? How do you go from that first scene that you've just written to a novel? It's actually really simple. You just do that again and again and again. But this time you do it really strategically. So you have an idea. What you need now is a beginning, a middle and an end. So this is what you do. This is a little bit complicated, but relevant. What I want you to think about now is the very best start of a book or a movie that you've ever seen. What strikes you as really brilliant? Now, usually the start is a scene setting section. And now, my favourite novel beginning is this here. An orphan child is adopted by a hilarious friend of family who teaches the child the alphabet and swear words. It's just the opening chapter. Novel. And it's absolutely brilliant, it's really hysterical. Now, what I've written here is X, an orphan child, is adopted by Y. It's really useful when you do this exercise, and Y will come uh, really clear later, to replace character names just with X and Y. And rather than writing he or she, just write they, so it remains genderless, because that's something that you can uh, decide later. This is actually the beginning of another Daphne de Maurier novel called My Cousin Rachel. And I absolutely love that because it's really charming and it's not, you know, boy meets girl, boring, boring, boring. It's unusual. It's a young boy and why is actually his uncle. His name is Hugo and he's insane and brilliant. And one of the first things he does in the novel is he takes his little nephew, who's about seven, to go and see a manly hand. This is a strange man. He doesn't do it for any kind of sinister reason. He just goes, oh, it's a nice outing, isn't it? He's very, very odd. But that's a really clever opening chapter, I think, because it takes place 20 years before the main narrative. But everything that happens in the rest of the book is informed by this relationship that this little boy has with his uncle. Even once he's an adult, everything that he does is coloured by the way that his uncle brought him up when he was really, really small. So what I would like you to do is do exactly that. Think about whichever story, whichever film, whichever TV series has the bang up best beginning that you have ever seen. And just write it down in exactly that format. Take out the names of the characters and replace them with X and Y and Z, or whatever the equivalent is if you're writing the characters. Does that make sense? Just note down the best beginning of anything that you've ever seen or read. Just one minute, easy. Just do it as a bullet point. So for those of you stuck for examples, you could do something like Harry Potter, where a mysterious child is abandoned on the doorstep of his own uncle. You could do Pride and Prejudice, where five sisters in a very impoverished household realise that a very rich man has moved in next door. You could do Bridget Jones, you could do anything that you want. And stop. Hopefully you've got something. Hopefully you've thought of something. Yes, maybe. Possibly. Okay, the next step, surprise, surprise, is what goes in the middle of your ideal story. What you want, what we mean by the middle of the story, is the big plot point. Stories tend to have climaxes. So what is the climax, the best climax of a story that you've ever read? Now mine is this. X fails to save the love of Y's life. Now that is an orphan novel. That's from a TV series with black sails. Have any of you seen it? No, it's about pirates, it's great. But there's a moment when um, the captain of the ship realises that he has left behind the, the wife of his first mate. And he thinks about saving her and going back to her, but then he doesn't. But then when he sees his friend, he sort of goes, oh no, he's miserable, I should have done something. And the look of pain on his face when he realises what a terrible mistake he's made. 
is absolutely incredible, and it's a real high point. So this is a huge moment, and it changes everyone's relationship with everyone else ever after. So this is a kind of history spinning the penny moment. It's really fantastic. But other examples might be the moment that Ned Stark decides to go to King's Landing in Game of Thrones. It might be the moment that, um, in the Fellowship of the Ring when Frodo decides to take the ring to Mordor. It might be the moment in Harry Potter when, in the of the Stone, when he decides to go into the secret passages and look for the Philosopher's of the Stone. So anything like that, anything from any of your favourite stories, movies, films, where this is the, there's an amazing turning point in the narrative. Just note it down. And once again, replace the names with X and Y. Just for a minute, when you go. And stop. Hopefully again, you've got something cool. Now, Surprise, surprise, you need an ending. But we're going to do something slightly different for the ending. What I don't want you to do is take an ending that you like. Personally, because I don't like any endings. But what I want you to do is think of an ending to any book, movie, TV series that you hated, that drove you completely mad with fury when you thought about it. You went, that should not have happened. That's such rubbish. Why did they end it like that? Think of one of those. Now mine is the ending of a really good trilogy of books um, called the Sea Trilogy by William Golding. William Golding's a guy who um, who wrote oh, yes. Lord of Spies. Thank you very much. Thank you. See, you wouldn't even know that I actually teach books for a little bit, would you? But I'm really stupid. This. this is the ending of um, the Sea Trilogy. Now, a young man has sailed to Australia. And he's built up an amazing relationship with the second mate on the on the ship. And they're so they're so close and so brilliant. And then the young man decides to completely ignore his friend and marry a very pointless, uninspiring, boring society girl. Meanwhile, his friend burns to death with a ship fire. What? How is that closure? That's terrible. That is not how you end a trilogy of books, is it? That's awful. That drove me mad for weeks after I read it. I was furious. Think of the last time that you were made furious by the ending of the book. Just note that down. It's your second to last bullet point. Again, you've got one minute to make it. Of course, the most hated ending of all time was because of all of you. Okay, and stop. Quickly thoughts. Now, final step, this is the last thing I'm going to make you do, and then you can just switch off if you want to. You can hurl your piece of paper at me, that's absolutely fine, because the torture will have ended. The final thing I want you to do is think about that ending and write down how it should have happened. What is the better ending? So for me, the young man finally comes to his senses, turns the annoying society girl over the side of the ship and settles down with the first mate. That's what any sane human would have done. What about the ordinary things? What frustrated you? How do you change it? How do you make that into a good ending? That's your final bullet point. I think another one for me is Cinderella. Like, it's awful, the ending is terrible. She settles down with a man who is almost fooled by her stepsisters because they just and her awful feet into a glass slipper. And he doesn't even recognise that. That's horrible. Why would you marry a man like that? You should have decided to be a spinster forever and buy nine cats. Okay? And stop. That's it. That's everything. It's over. You're okay. You didn't implode. Now, what you have in front of you now is actually the structure of the novel or the short story that you should be writing. You have, at the beginning, a particular scene that interested you. That can fall anywhere in the novel. But you also have a beginning, a middle that you feel passionate about, and an end that you feel even more passionate about because you rewrote it yourself. That is everything that you need. Those are the stepping stones for a complete story. All you have to do now is go home and join the market. <laughs>
<laughs> That's the whole other can of worms. <laughs> I hope that was useful. I hope that you enjoyed that. You are left 15 minutes here for questions, if you have any questions. Does anybody have any questions? Do you just put your hand up the screen? Yes, maybe in a second way. I do have a question about um, the last bit um, of the exercise, uh, because just now you were saying that uh, perhaps um, they got the worst and they got like um, a story not being a good exception for the end one. But I mean, I feel like there are two types of um, endings that you make. First of all, it's um, made because it's like badly written. But the second type to me, it could be because you're so invested in the story. Um, say, for example, for me, it's uh, recently um, Hermione choosing. Wrong instead of very <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. Yes, and so um, that's what, I think it's very beautifully written. But at the same time, it's because I'm so invested in the love life of um, these characters that I actually hate this result. And um, but isn't that a part of the brilliance of how uh, like the ending of the story? Uh, I mean, it, it's the worst, but at the same time, it could be um, the worst being a sort of brilliance. Is and if that makes sense, it was. <laughs> It makes complete sense, but I think you've got far too much confidence in writers as agreed. I think that is a terrible ending. And the reason that it doesn't work is that when J.K. Rowling was writing Harry Potter, as I think you probably already know, she wrote the final chapter of the final novel before she'd even written the second book. So she was trying to trace the trajectory that she would write to. She was trying to say, well, this is the end point. But obviously, the idea that you have for a seven book series is going to change while you're writing it. So when she originally wrote that final chapter where they're all sort of in their thirties and they're all you know, coupled up and they've got kids, she probably thought that she was going to write in a lot more romance between Hermione and Ron. But it just never happened. What happened was that Hermione ended up having a much closer relationship with Harry. She should have changed the end chapter. So I think you're being so forgiving when you say, oh, maybe it's bad but really. No, it's just bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it's completely fine for you to look at a published novel and say, no, that is a pile of rubbish and it should be different. And that's part of what you have to do as a writer. You have to be brave enough to isolate the moment where someone has really got it wrong. That's fine. Just be arrogant. It's fine. The, the, I think the, mo the reason that I got any kind of success in my job was that I was just so towering arrogant, I just thought I knew better than everyone else, and then everyone believed me! So, yeah. Are there any other questions? I don't have to dive on you in the microphone. Just... Anyone else? Does anyone want to be brave? No? Okay, in that case, I've got some final just words of advice for the way um, that you can flesh out stories if you want to go ahead and flesh them out. Now, how many people have heard of this? How many people have heard of plot arcs? It's just the way that the shape of the story develops. And this is really important when you're thinking about um, writing plot and thinking about well, what actually happens in this book. Now, some of you would have written down a list of bullet points where the stakes are really high and everything that happens is really important. Now, when I say plot arc, what I'm talking about is this graph. And you will see writers kind of gesticulating wildly and saying, isn't the plot arc marvellous, darling, or doesn't it aren't very low? What they mean is this, this graph. This axis is a measure of tension. One is, well, nor is life as normal. No real difficulties, everything's okay. Right at the top, you've got certain death. The axis at the bottom is a measurement of the percentage of the way through the book you're on. This will make sense when I actually explain the points. So say you take a book like Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Life as normal is, is for Harry, life with the dirties. He leads a very, very cloistered, boring, almost imprisoned life in a suburban town in the south of England, um, which I suppose to some people will sound exotic, but I promise it's not. It's the most boring place in the universe, and you don't want to go there. It's just acre after acre of semi-detached houses. So the tension starts at almost now. But then Harry realises that he has strange abilities. He, there's that moment at the zoo where he talks to the snake. And at this point, the, the stakes are a little bit higher because you know 
that Uncle Vernon is going to be really angry with him because Dudley's got a trouble, right? So you go, okay, so we just going on here, but it's someone you know a little bit of the way through the book, so you don't want the tension to be too bad, you just want the reader to go, oh, really? This is interesting. This is how you get readers to carry on and push the plot arc upward, you keep up the tension. And then what we have is this, this slow climb of tension. Harry realises that he's a wizard. Harry arrives. Harry gets to Hogwarts. And then we realise that something is a bit wrong with Professor Quidditch, don't we? We realise that he goes out into the Flint Forest and he's drinking unicorn. This is a dark moment, very good moment. This is a book about an 11 year old boy. This is the moment where we go, oh, there are actual real stakes here. He could be in real danger. He's in real physical harm. So tension is quite high. Then he goes into the secret corridors. He meets Voldemort and could actually die, but he's okay. And we come all the way down again, back to normal life at Dursley's. That's what we mean by plot arc. That moment of climax, we call it a climax because it is the top of the arc. Instead, what do you call a a novel that doesn't have this climb down at the end, just leaves you at the high point. Cliffhanger, exactly, and that's what we're talking about. That image of the cliff is exactly the shape that the plot makes. Does that make sense? So that's the kind of plot that you will write if your favourite novels are quite adventury, if they're quite like Harry Potter or Game of Thrones. But I imagine that some of you have written, have, some of you have got a bullet point list where your favourite books are actually much quieter than that. Maybe it's kind of very literary stuff like Mrs. Dowell, or you know, anything where there's not kind of huge, massive personal stakes that people might dump. Maybe it's about someone's lost their dog. Now, that is what we call a low plot arc. And so, to take the example that I mentioned before, how many of you know Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway? Yeah, literally nothing happens, doesn't it? It's really, really low. Mrs. Dalloway, a woman called Clarissa, who's been married for several years, decides to throw a party, she throws the party, it's boring, and we come down from the other side. That's the problem, Mrs. Dalloway, I kid you not. Now, one of the things that stories with low plot arcs tend to do is they've got a low plot arc because the point of the story is not the story. The point is beautiful language and experiment. If you're interested in prose, in style, in pouring poetry, the story. What we want is a plot that looks like that, because then the reason for the reader to keep going is your gorgeous style. If you were to write an amazing, complicated, very difficult style into a story like this, something is going to become very hard to follow very quickly, because you've got to explain all kinds of interesting, perilous um, concepts as you go along. It would be really hard to follow if this was all in really experimental language, really difficult. I think one of the reasons that Harry Potter is so um, successful is that language is really simple, but the world is incredibly complex. So the more complex the concept, the simpler your, the simpler your language should become. And likewise, the simpler concept, like this, if you've got a very low plot up, the more complicated and the more poetic your language can become. Usually, you can't do both. Usually, you can't do really boring language and a really boring plot, and you can't do really ornate language and a really ornate plot. There are some books that do both, and often they're the ones that do, well, the latter, the ones that do kind of well. Books that plot are the ones that have boring language and boring plot. So that's just something to think about. So that I don't know what style all of you like to write in, but just bear in mind that your style will very, very much affect the way that your plot develops and how high you raise the stakes. One final, final thing I just want to say to you. If you arc the plot too low, so if you have a shape that kind of does this, that's terrible. That's on a level with I had a pie. <laughs> that's not a story. Then you have a nice but low plot arc, perhaps this is that way, that's fine. You can have a nice high plot arc. This would be something like as we said, Harry Potter, or this would be the moment that Ned Stark dies in the first book of Game of Thrones. Spoilers, but you should read it by now. But you can go far too far the other way. Has anyone seen one of those like, really ridiculous science fiction films where the fate of the universe depends on this one person? Yeah, basically all of the Marvel franchise, right? <laughs> Everything. They overshoot. 
they make the stakes far too high. This is a way up here at 110%. Is the universe will explode? No need. What you need, the tension is derived from the threat to somebody who you care about. Not to the entire world, to the entire universe. There is no point ever in writing a ridiculously high form. Always keep it within that nice range between the Mrs. Alloway and Harry Potter, which is, I think, the oddest thing I've ever said. <laughs> so, that's all the advice I have to give you. Once again, does anyone want to ask a question at this point? Or are you all happy? Oh, hello, yes. Hi. Would you like to know? Just tell about, like, um, for a story and in yeah. Sometimes, if like if the philosophy is terrible, and you want to tell from the like semantic point of view, then you make it like not that exciting. It's like Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Tragedy. But right. if it's not a tragedy, I don't think like many of us know. Yeah. yeah. You don't want that to then end up in the world. That um, I think you're completely right. There, there are plot endings that will make you sad. But that doesn't mean that they're bad endings. That doesn't mean that the writer hasn't built them up properly, that it doesn't make sense in the story. That's not what I call a bad ending. It's a sad ending, but not a bad one. So I wouldn't change the ending of Romeo and Juliet. But what I would change is the ending of stuff like Magic Measure, or Comedy of Errors, or any one of those other really silly plays where a load of women who hate a load of idiots get married to you again. Whoops. Instead of stabbing them in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am inciting you to violence, sorry. So if that, I hope that answers your question. Sad endings are not bad endings. And if you have something to say, um, a point about tragedy to make, then make it. That's fine. Any final questions? Last chance, we No. In that case, thank you very much. Thank you for being patient and participating. You are free to leave. <laughs>